Today, we're going to speak about micro pantries as a form of community resilience in the face of the food insecurity exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our guests today are Reverend Wendy Miller Olapade of the United Church of Christ in Medford, Massachusetts, Professor Norbert Wilson, who's Professor of Food Economics and Community at Duke University, and lead author of a recent paper on micro pantries, Sarah Folta, who's with the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food podcast. I'm Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University. So Wendy and Norbert and Sarah, I'm delighted to have you. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Sarah, let's start with you. Can you describe what a micro pantry is? I know a lot of people won't be familiar with that term and explain why you decided to study these as a community coping strategy during the pandemic. Sure. So the best way to describe them, I think, is if people are familiar with little free libraries, they're very similar to that. So the usual structure is a box on a pole and the box you would fill with food. Sometimes they have other configurations and people have done things like convert old newspaper boxes and so forth. But the general idea is that it's a small box in a neighborhood where people can put food and take food. They're also sometimes called blessing boxes or little free pantries. The way they work is there's often a volunteer or an organization that takes oversight of them and has primary upkeep, but they're anonymous and open to all to contribute or take from them. And the way I got interested is because there's actually one in my neighborhood and Honestly, I became pretty obsessed with it. Early in the pandemic, I started taking walks around the neighborhood as I was working at home and I'd go buy this one and just became very fascinated with what's in there, what's going in, what's coming out and started putting stuff in myself. And as I learned more, I realized there were these little free pantries or micro pantries all across the city. And then I realized they're across the country too. So as a nutrition professor, I've studied food choice among very low income folks. And I was also very much aware of how the pandemic had disrupted the food supply and realized that micro pantries were a part of the solution and had many advantages, in fact, in a pandemic situation. So I became very curious about their role. You know, I thought it was an interesting phenomenon to learn more about. And what I put in, I saw it go out and I wanted to know the stories behind what was coming out. So Sarah, it's a fascinating concept. And so nobody from outside the community is stocking this, a food bank or a food pantry or anything. It's all done by people who are residing in the community, it sounds like. We'll talk about the study that you did and published, but before we do that, before you started officially studying, what kind of things did you observe about the kinds of foods going in? Was there a lot of in and out? Was it heavily used? You're right in saying that it's not stocked by a food bank or a pantry. It's entirely neighbors helping neighbors. So it's people in the neighborhood putting things in for their neighbors. And there's obviously a lot of non-perishable canned goods and such, and certainly saw a lot of that in the micro pantries. And I saw very high turnover. And I think that was one of the things that really caught my eye at first and fascinated me, you know, just seeing even stuff I would put in, I'd go a couple hours later and it was already out going one morning and on my morning walk. And then the next morning, everything had completely turned over and there were new things in there. So realizing what a need it was filling, you name it, it was in there. A lot of it was very healthy food or, you know, still is like very healthy food. I saw a lot of canned beans, like legumes, some canned fruits and vegetables, relatively healthy for a non-perishable. I also saw every so often someone will put in sweets, which drives me crazy. Not that people don't want sweets every now and then, but that it would cause an (laughs) ant problem (laughs) in the micro pantry. So, you know, everything in moderation, but not when it comes to the feast for ants, I guess. So (laughs) interesting way of looking at it. So Reverend Wendy, I referred to you as that because you said that's what your parishioners call you. Let's shift over to you now. So I understand that you organized a citywide micro pantry system in your town, Medford, Massachusetts. Can you talk about what this is and who it reaches? 
Well, thank you so much for including me in this conversation. And I just need to say to Sarah and Norbert and you, Kelly, what an honor it is that somebody took the time to pay attention to this. I'm sitting here in my office a little choked up by the story of Sarah's interest and her work. And when I got the chance to see the paper, you know, it was very powerful to see the outcome of what, from my perspective, as a pastor who is not a nutritionist, although my mother's a nutritionist, ironically, but, you know, a pastor whose purpose was to just spread love and care, who feels, and forgive the reference, Jesus told me to do this. <laughs> you know, we, out of our faith, a colleague of mine, Tom Hathaway, who serves the other UCC church here in Medford, actually installed the first micro pantry by his church in the hillside neighborhood next to Tufts. I got jealous and said, I want one of those at my church. And so this all happened before the pandemic. We installed the micro pantry that Sarah was obsessed with was the third one that we installed that we helped another church install. So, you know, it started out as having nothing to do with the pandemic and everything to do with our sense of loving our neighbor, that Jesus calls us to do that. And so we should find ways to do that. The intention to give people who are not a part of the church meaning and purpose in their life. And so, you know, one of the things that is so meaningful about doing this is that everybody can spread love, even if they're not a believer, if, even if they're not involved in our church. They can as somebody said to me once really early on, I can't do much, but I can put a 50 cent can of beans in that micro pantry and show my kids that we have the responsibility to love our neighbor. So that was really the starting point. When the pandemic happened, when other people started to see the opportunity to give, to serve, to care for their neighbor, our motto is take what you need, leave what you can. And that this system allowed for a really just way of doing that. So, you know, a lot of the other systems require that you show up with your ID and you sign up with your address and so on and so forth. And, you know, there are many members of our community who don't feel a sense of safety in doing that, whether it has to do with their immigration status or just their lives are such that they can't show up. They don't have the car to go to the pantry or whatever, right? They don't have the time away from work to show up when the pantry is open. So that this 24-7, 365, no questions asked, nobody's measuring how much you take, it's just available, created access in a way that other parts of the system don't have. And don't get me wrong, this is not a solution to the food security, but it is one little way for neighbors to help neighbors. So once we started to put a few of them out there and really use social media to publicize the availability of it, people started to say, I want one in my neighborhood. I want to do that. And so it began to build. And then the pandemic just exploded the need and people's commitment to serve. We had help from the Department of Public Works in our community. The mayor got involved and started to ask them to build the boxes. We worked to find these sponsors. So each micro pantry, we have 17 of them now in the community. Oh, this is a city of about 60,000 residents. We have 17 of these micro pantries and each one is quote owned by a different community group. Some of them are owned by faith communities. Some of them are sponsored by Boy Scout troops and Girl Scout troops and a community service group at the high school. So there's a wide range of people who, quote, own, making sure that things stay safe and filled and clean. And, you know, it's a pretty amazing thing. Like we don't do a lot of management, but my church maintains a website and maintains the social media system that keeps them visible and keeps people engaged. This is really inspiring to me. And I'm going to ask a question that you partially answered already. And here's the question. So there are very tangible benefits, obviously, to something like this, because people who are without enough food are able to get at least some of it through these micro pantries. So that's terrific. But there are also symbolic benefits to this that you pointed out, that, that the people in the community can get directly involved in addressing food insecurity by giving what they can. Is there symbolism that's important too for the recipients of the food? 
Do you think it matters to the people who are taking the food, who it came from, the way the community is involved? What, what do you think about all that? What a beautiful question, Kelly. Yeah, I absolutely do. I've heard anecdotally, and I know Sarah has, you know, sort of referenced this in her work, the recognition that my neighbor cares enough to help me. I've heard from many, many people who have reached out in gratitude to say, thank you. Thank you for giving me a place to show up. Thank you for helping my neighbors to support me at a time when things are really, really difficult. Thank you for normalizing love of neighbor. So that's a beautiful question and absolutely yes. Oh, it's so nice to hear that. Well, and then the community ownership of it extends also beyond the two individuals, let's say, who are dropping the food off and then receiving the food. There's also the community organization. So it's nice that there's so much community involvement and ownership in this. When I talk about how many people this touches, I'm talking in the thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There are hundreds of people who drop cans off in each of those micro pantries. And you multiply that times 17 micro pantries times 365 days a year. That's a lot of people being served and a lot of people who are able to serve. And that feels pretty good. Oh, so nice. Norbert, let's turn to you. And I'd like to ask you a question. So I know that one theme of your own research focuses on the economics of food insecurity. And so from that perspective, what did you learn or what surprised you during the research for this paper that we're talking about? Great. Thank you, Kelly. And, and I want to start by saying thanks to Sarah for bringing this topic to me. And it was good to reconnect with you, Reverend Wendy, to learn about this project. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of the work that you and others in the community are out there doing. As a, a researcher who's tended to work on quantitative studies, so grateful for the opportunity to work with Sarah on this qualitative study to understand the stories behind the numbers, um, to understand how people are really living with the challenges of food security. And I think there's something really important about what our study did in reference to what happened nationally. So this is in the middle of the pandemic. Lots of people were greatly concerned about food insecurity. We saw the lines up and down food pantries or food banks reported in the news. And we sort of anticipated that food insecurity rates would go through the roof, at least the official numbers. And I think many of us were surprised when the national numbers came back that they were no different in 2020 as they were in 2019, which was surprising for some people. And one of the things that a lot of people have argued is that there were a number of support programs, unemployment insurance, the child tax credits. There were a number of policies that the federal government implemented. And Feeding America and the Food Banking Network really did increase their service to provide help for folks. But when we were doing these interviews, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that we learned is that folks are really struggling. I was amazed to hear how some families had sent, if you will, their child to their parents to go live with the grandparents because the kids weren't in school. And the family, the parents couldn't afford to provide the meals through the day, but they knew that their grandparents could, that the grandparents could do it. And seeing how families made these major shifts in their lives just to meet these needs. Now, these are individuals who are participating in the food pantry, in the micro pantries. So I, I am not questioning the numbers at the federal level. Now, I will say there was an increase in disparity where Black and Hispanic households were more food insecure at a greater rate than white households. And so there's something important that did happen during the pandemic. And I think that there's going to be a lot of research that's going to actually understand that better. But the fact that families were really trying to make ends meet in really innovative and, and complex ways, some early work that Sarah and I had done really reflected on the complex ways that families were helping their families eat using food pantries and using complex systems with the grocery store in terms of benefits and uh, coupons. And we worried that during the pandemic, all of those complex systems fell apart because you couldn't go to the store like you once could. The challenges of supplies were in question. And, and so I was so grateful to see communities find innovative ways of helping people meet their food needs through these micro pantries. And as Reverend Wendy made it very clear, it wasn't going to solve the problem. But we did hear from patrons who used the micro pantries that it did meet some of their food needs and it helped stretch the meals that they were able to get. And so that was really important to hear that even that small bit of help was important. 
I was really struck by listening to not only the people who were able to get food, but those people were also people who were able to give food. And I think that's a very different model than what we normally think of when we think about food pantries. There was a sense of pride and community fellowship and the notion of mutual aid was something that came through in some of the interviews with the patrons of these micro pantries. They realized that some things we didn't want. And so we were able to leave food that someone else would want. And not in the sense of didn't want because it was something wrong with the food, but rather we knew that that wasn't a preference of our family. And we knew that other families could benefit from this. This idea of security and, and dignity of being able to give and not just receive was an important thing that I've heard. But it was also striking to listen to the people who were setting up these micro pantries. This sense of community and wanting to support folks regardless of background and having a real interest to give people the freedom to take food as they need it. Not to monitor, not to surveil, but just put it out there. Hopefully someone's going to take it. And then when there is a need for more, giving more. It totally changed the way I understood how we can do the work that we're doing. Lastly, I'll say, I really do hope that there is further work in this space to understand how these systems work. It really challenged the way I thought about what communities can do and, and maybe even what they should do. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to get to learn from both folks like Reverend Wendy and then also with Sarah Folta, who brings an important lens in terms of understanding how people are making good choices when it comes to food. Thank you, Norbert. There's something that you all have reminded me of, which is that so often the solutions to problems, including food insecurity, are very top-down oriented, where governments of one sort or another, or foundations, or universities, or somebody declares what a solution to a community problem might be without the community getting an opportunity to exercise its own ingenuity and determine what its own solutions might be. And this is a very community-driven solution that sounds creative, effective, inspired, involved. There's so many wonderful things about it. I really appreciate hearing about this. So, Sarah, we began with you. Let me end by asking you this question. In addition to the things that Norbert said came about as a result of the study, what do you think some of the takeaway messages might be? I guess the other takeaway is not only people needing the food, but neighbors needing to give the food, you know, in this sense, in the pandemic and all of our lives disrupted, another thing we heard was, I want to do something. I want to give back to my community. I want to help my community. I want to care for my neighbor. And so few ways to do that in the pandemic, especially in the early days. And so during the isolation of those early days, it gave a concrete way to connect neighbor directly with neighbor. So I think on both sides, it really so much achieved that sense of community that got so disrupted. Thank you all for contributing to this podcast. I'm really very moved by this. And boy, I hope the idea spreads so that there are more communities doing these sort of things. And Norbert, your call for additional research, I hope that gets heated and more and more people learn about the results of these things. So thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kelly. So our guests today have been Reverend Wendy Miller Olapade, Professor Norbert Wilson, and Sarah Folta, who did this study on micro pantries. It really is quite unique. And thank you to our listeners for being with us. If you'd like to subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food podcast series, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. Podcasts and transcripts are also available on the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.